Welcome to Gospel Chariot Production. My name is Reginald Charles Gardner. A journey through the book of John. We're going to be looking at how John is contrasted with the Old Testament beginning with Genesis. For example, Genesis and the Old Testament deal primarily with that which is physical. But when we get to the book of John, we're going to see that Jesus takes it to another level, and he's going to be dealing with that which is spiritual. We want to be mindful of grammar. It's always important when you're looking at the Word of God to use proper grammar. I'm going to be using a New King James translation. With that, let's continue on. In the beginning, God. What beginning? Talking about that creation story. God, right away, brings us to a spiritual thought. But what does he do? He says, and let there be light. What's interesting, as he goes on, he says, and he separated the light from the darkness. Have you ever really thought about that? He separated the light from the darkness. You cannot separate something from something else unless at one time they were together. God created light. And that will become more obvious to us as we continue on in our study. As he created light and separated the light from the darkness, we learned that he then created the sun and the moon, the stars. And then he also said that he separated the uh, firmament from that which was below, from that which was above. And then the waters, he said, he gathered them into one place, so dry land appeared. From that, then, he created all the sea creatures and the birds of the air. We learned that he created the uh, vegetation, uh, the animal life, Adam and Eve. And Adam then was responsible for naming each creature that was upon the earth. As we move into John chapter 1, we see something very similar to what we read in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So now we have recorded, again, the beginning, going back to that creation story. But we're introduced to a new term, the Word. In the Greek language, we have logos. And that word, by its definition, and this is very important, means of speech, a word, uttered by a living voice, embodies a conception or idea. What someone has said, a word, the sayings of God, decree, mandate, or order, of the moral precepts given by God. Let's go on down the slide here. In John denotes the essential word of God, Jesus Christ, the personal wisdom and power in union, and I'd also interject there, unity with God. His minister in creation and government of the universe. The cause of all the world's life, both physical and ethical, and I would also interject there, spiritual. Which for the procurement of man's salvation, put on human nature in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, the second person in the Godhead, and shone forth conspicuously from his words and deeds. So, in the beginning, the Word. There's a message. The Word is conveying a message, and that Word is, as looking at this definition, Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 1, verse 12, 
But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Now let's look at that for just a second. We're probably all familiar with the Constitution of the United States. I quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, where did our forefathers get that understanding? Well, obviously, from the Bible. But the reason why I pointed that out, because it talks about rights. Now, we have rights. That does not automatically guarantee that we're going to practice those rights. Other words, let's continue to read here in John chapter 1, verse 12. He says he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. All right. In order for us to have the right to become children, it goes to those who believe in his name. Now, as we continue on through the reading of the book of John. In other words, there's those who think that just the mental exercise of believing is all that a person needs to do. No, no more than it is with the Constitution of the United States. Just simply sitting in a chair someplace and going through the mental exercise of believing, are you going to have those rights? He goes on to say in verse 13, who were born. Wow. Who were born. And so we're talking about a spiritual concept. What do you mean, Gardner? Well, he's already talking to people in the flesh. So he's not talking about being born in the flesh. Continue to read on here. Who were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So right here, beginning in the very first chapter, Jesus is raising us to another level. He's trying to convey a spiritual thought, and he's trying to move these Jews and us today to a spiritual understanding. That if we want to be children of God, then we need to believe in Jesus and we need to be born and not born to the blood and not born to the flesh and not born by the will of man, but we need to be born of God. And he's going to get into that a little more as we continue on. John chapter 1 verse 25 and following. And they, this would be the chief priest, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, that would be John the Baptist, answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. I want you to understand this is a question that's being asked by the chief priest. The very first thing they ask is, why do you baptize? This is important because there are religious people today that try to say that baptism is not important. It's not essential. John the Baptist was born for the very purpose of preparing the way and setting the way straight for Jesus, and he did so by baptizing and therefore even took the name John the Baptist. Now let's continue on. John answered them saying, I baptize with water. 
but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he coming after me is preferred before me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. These things were done in Betha Barbara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. He didn't see a physical lamb, but he referred to Jesus as a Lamb of God. Why? Going back to the Exodus story when the children of Israel left Egypt and they were to take a lamb that was without blemish and they were to butcher it, put the blood on the doorpost and the lentils, and they then were to eat the lamb before or for the Passover. Now, he is saying here that this Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is our Passover. And what kind of a Passover? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So now we're starting to begin this believing process. We need to believe that Jesus is that Passover lamb that is going to deliver us from sin. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. For he was before me. Well, that's interesting. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. But yet, John says that Jesus was before him. Showing that Jesus is not just a mere man, but he is God and he existed before John the Baptist. I did not know him, but he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. All right, John himself, we learn in this reading, and when I say this reading, also here in the book of John, that John baptized for the remission of sins. But he goes on, he says in verse 32, John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him, that would be this Jesus. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So again, John is baptizing with water, but he says there's one coming after him. That's this Jesus, the Lamb of God. And he says that he is coming to baptize. Again, the emphasis is being put upon baptism. But he said earlier that God gives us the right to become children of God if we believe in this Jesus. Well, he's not talking about just the simple mental exercise of believing. In other words, there's those that must come to Jesus and to be baptized. Let's continue on. John chapter 3, verse 3 and following. This is a story of Nicodemus. You're probably familiar with it. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? In other words, Nicodemus is set on the 
physical. He, his mind cannot grasp what Jesus is saying because he can't look past the physical. But he goes on. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born to the water and the spirit, remember I talked about grammar, and is a conjunction. He says that we must be born of the water and the spirit. John baptized with water. Jesus is going to baptize with water and the Spirit. We've been talking from the very beginning about how we have the right to become children of God if we believe in this Jesus. The whole conversation has been building up to this baptism and how we are born. He continues on. He cannot enter the kingdom of God, that spiritual abode. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Obviously, he's talking to Nicodemus, who's already been born, and he's in the flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from, and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. God is Spirit. And we have a difficult time because we're in the flesh grasping that which is spiritual and understanding where does the Spirit come from and where is it going to. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things or do not know these things? Here's Nicodemus trying to grasp what Jesus is saying because Nicodemus cannot get his mind off of the physical. As we continue on in John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Therefore the Lord, when he knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized, there we are again, baptizing, baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. Again, I remind you how we began in John chapter 1, that he gave us the right, the right to become children. And how do we do that? By believing in Jesus. John came baptizing in water. John says that Jesus came to baptize in water and the Spirit. Now we learn that the Pharisees themselves understand that Jesus is baptizing more disciples or followers. That's what disciple means, followers, than John, even though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples did. As we continue on in the book of John, chapter 4, most of you are familiar with the story of the Samaritan woman, how Jesus is sitting at the well, and the Samaritan woman comes to draw water, and Jesus asks her for a drink. And she then says, You, being a Jew, would ask a Samaritan for water? She even kind of ridicules him a little bit, like, well, you didn't even bring anything to draw water with. And Jesus tells her that if she understood who she was talking with, and that he would give her water, that she'd never be thirsty again. And she asks, well, you give me this water that I might not come to this well anymore. 
Then the conversation turned into, well, go get your husband and bring him here. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, you have spoken truthfully. You have had five and a man that you're with now is not your husband. All of a sudden, the lights came on. She realized that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ who comes to save the world. Then in the conversation, Jesus then says, you Samaritans worship on a mountain whom you do not know, but us Jews worship in Jerusalem, the God that we do know. And he says, God is spirit. So he takes the conversation from the physical water to the spiritual drink and that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Again, following that line from John chapter 1 all the way through, Jesus is trying to move these people from this physical understanding and using the physical to help them to understand the spiritual. As we move on to John chapter 6 verse 49 and following, we have this conversation again going back to the Old Testament. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will not, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? What was happening? They again were caught in the physical and not making a transition to the spiritual, and they began to see Jesus as cannibalistic and so they asked the question how can this man give us his flesh to eat 53 then Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about what we know as the Lord's Supper, the communion that takes place in Acts chapter 2 when Jesus, or after Jesus, is raised from the dead. Also recorded in Matthew chapter 26, if you want to, uh, to read that. Also recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, the Lord continues on this progressive path of how we become 
children of God. And we do it by believing in Jesus and being baptized into the water and into the spirit. And from there, we're able then to partake of this communion meal that he's talking about and as I mentioned, recorded in Matthew, in Corinthians, and also in other places. John chapter 6, verse 30, or excuse me, John chapter 6, verse 63 and following. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. So again, Jesus is trying to elevate us past this concept of just mere physical or the fleshly. The words that I speak to you are spirit. That goes back to what I shared with you when we looked at the definition of the word logos or logos, however you want to pronounce it. And so Jesus says the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe, or some of you who do not want to believe and obey. For example, if I see you standing out there in the middle of the highway, and I call out to you and say, hey, there's a big semi coming, well, you can yell back to me, I believe it. Yeah. But is your belief going to move you to action? But there are the some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning, going back to the creation, who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. There is an action. Because they did not believe, they were going to betray him. Well, the flip side of that is, if you believe, then there must be an action which you take. And that action would be obedience to baptism in the water and the spirit. And then partaking of his flesh and his blood. And he said, therefore... I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Well, why does he say that? Well, we'll learn a little bit later. Because the things that he says and the things that he does, he does because it was commanded to him by his Father. And so when you obey Jesus, you're obeying the Father. John chapter 7, verse 38 and following. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said. What scriptures is he talking about? He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament has not been written yet. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Remember what we was just reading just earlier? about the Samaritan woman and giving her living water that she would not have to draw water from this well, according to her understanding. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, would receive future tense. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. And what are we talking about there? We're talking about Jesus and his being arrested and his death and his burial and his resurrection. So, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will be given to those who believe, but it will not happen until after 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Brings us full circle. We was talking in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning God. In the beginning God said, Let there be light. The well, light illuminates. Light helps you and I to see. Light was separated from darkness. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. He's not talking about physical darkness. He's talking about sin. But have the light of life. Well, he was talking about the water giving life. Now he says that he is the light of the world, which gives life. Jesus uses a number of metaphors to try to convey the same spiritual teaching or thought. Again, we are given the, the right to become children if we believe in Jesus. That believing means there's an act of obedience. He says that we must be born. And that born is an action. That's not passive. And John told us that he was baptizing with water, but Jesus was baptizing those who believe in him, and he was baptizing them with the water and the spirit. And we continue on that those who are obedient to Christ then will become children of God. And they will partake then of his body and his blood, the communion meal. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Again, when you go back to the context, Jesus is reasoning with the Jews. And he makes reference to Abraham, that he was before Abraham. And they said, you're not even 50 years old, and you were before our father Abraham? Yes, because see, they can't get their mind past the physical. And Jesus is explaining he is the son of God, that he existed before Abraham and he says I am well let's look at that I am in grammar I am the past I am the present I am the future I am the past present and future I am that's what Jesus is saying John chapter 9 verse 5 as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I am the one who illuminates sin, that you might see what sin is. I am the one that helps you to understand that which comes from above, that which is spiritual. I am the one to help you to see John chapter 10, verse 6 and following. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he had spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Well, what illustration was Jesus using? He was using the illustration that he was the shepherd of the sheep. 
But again, he was not talking about a physical shepherd, and he was not talking about physical sheep. A shepherd is responsible for feeding the sheep or feeding the flock. Jesus had already talked to us about how it was necessary for the believers to be baptized in water and the spirit and to participate and partaking of his flesh and the blood. Not physical flesh and not physical blood. Now he says he is the door. Well, what does a door do? It gives you entrance. And he is the door of the sheep or the sheep fold. Giving us entrance into that spiritual domain John chapter 10 verse 15 as a father knows me even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep again trying to convey a spiritual thought by using a physical example these people understood that a shepherd when he has his sheep together in the sheep fold or in the pen, the shepherd will physically lay at the entrance to keep the wolves from coming into the sheep. But Jesus now is using this metaphor to convey a spiritual thought that he is the one who's going to lay down his life for the flock or for the sheep or for the believers and other sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up. This command I have received from my Father. I mentioned this earlier. Remember, this command I receive from my Father. So the things that Jesus does and the things that Jesus says, he does and he says according to that which is commanded him by his heavenly Father. Continuing on in John chapter 10, verse 28 and following. And I gave them, or I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Another passage that is uh, perverted and taken out of its context. There are some who say, once saved, always saved. That is not what it said here. He says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. In other words, somebody coming from outside is not going to have the power to snatch you away from God against your will. My Father, who has given them to me. Well, how did he do that? Well, we already read. Because Jesus is walking to walk and talking to talk of his Father. So, my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So, when I come to believe and obey, and I'm baptized 
into water and a spirit. And I'm partaking of that communion meal that represents the body and the blood of Jesus. And I'm faithful to him and I'm walking the walk and talking the talk. He says, no one has a power to snatch me from out of his hand. But if I choose, just like a husband or a wife, to become unfaithful, and all of a sudden a husband decides to cheat on the wife, well, he has walked away from that covenant that he made with her. And that's what's being said here. Nobody made him cheat on his wife. He did that of his own volition. But if I'm a faithful husband and I have somebody like the example of Joseph, remember that story with Potiphar's wife and how she tried to seduce him? He fled. He fled. But she still cried out rape, and he still went to prison. But he was still faithful, and God continued to bless him. John chapter 10, verse 34 and following. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? Well, what's the conversation? Well, because Jesus is saying to the Jew that he's the son of God, they then accused him of blasphemy. He responded to them by what is written in the law. I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Did you just hear that? Maybe some of you are not aware of this. But he says in the word of God, which is the scriptures, he says cannot be broken. Do you say of him, that would be Jesus, of whom the Father sanctified or set apart and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the son of God. If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works. That you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. So they can deny Jesus as being the son of God, but he says, how do you deny the works? I mean, the works are works that cannot be done by mere men, but they can only be done by God. So believe the works. In other words, trying again to move them from the physical to the spiritual. John chapter 11, verse 23 and following. This story is one that you're probably familiar with about the death of Lazarus. Jesus said to her, your brother will raise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will raise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, there's that word believe again. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now there's something that a lot of people do not understand. And I've been trying to illustrate from chapter 1 all the way through this believing. 
This believing is not just a mental exercise. This believing has to do with trusting in Jesus, obeying Jesus. And he says, and whoever believes will live and never die, will never die. Well, let's go on. Do you believe this? Now, how much clearer can that be? He asked Martha, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. I hear that from a lot of people today. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Well, let's continue. John chapter 11, verse 39 and following. Jesus said, now they're all at the tomb now. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, at this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Listen to what Jesus said. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? We just read that on a previous slide. Do you believe? Yes, Lord. <laughs> and here's Jesus now. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I say this that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Can you imagine? Even here at the tomb, these people still were wrapped up into the physical. Even when Jesus was talking to them as direct as he could talk to them, and even though they responded that they believed, they're telling him that this man has been dead for four days and he stinks. And Jesus has to turn right around and said, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Can you imagine? Can you just imagine what these people's minds were going through when Lazarus walked out of that tomb? John chapter 12, verse 27. And we have again where Jesus is trying to reason with the Jews. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. <laughs> again, they just refused 
to hear and understand. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Well, these folks were a little closer. And Jesus answered and said, the voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Isn't it interesting? They all heard the voice. It's very clear in what we just read. But someone to contribute the voice to thunder, while at least others contribute the voice to an angel. But Jesus again corrects them and tells them that they did hear a voice. And it wasn't for the sake of Jesus that the voice came, but it was for their sake. Why? To move them beyond the physical to understand the spiritual. And the same is true for us today. John chapter 14, verse 10 and following. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words, getting back to that, what we looked at at the beginning, the Logos. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Again, we covered this a couple of times already. When Jesus makes reference to when you hear him, that you're hearing the Father. When you obey him, you're obeying the Father. He says, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells or lives in me does the works, does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So if you don't want to believe me, Jesus, well, at least be honest enough to believe in the works. For the works speak for themselves. John chapter 20, verse 12 and following. This is uh, the scene at the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Here we are, even after all that they have seen and heard, the body of Jesus is gone and she does not know where it is. Verse 14, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned. And said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. <laughs> I really find this interesting. Again, with everything that she has seen and heard of Jesus. And Jesus clearly told her and the disciples that he was going to die and he was going to raise three days. And even at the grave, she still could not separate her mind from the physical. 
to that which was spiritual. John chapter 20, verse 26 and following. What we have here is Jesus has already shown himself to his disciples, but Thomas was not there at that time. So now it says, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. Some translations say it, doors being locked. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. And look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew that Thomas had already said to the rest of the disciples that he did not believe that Jesus had raised from the dead. And the only way that he was going to believe it is by putting his finger into the nail prints and putting his hand into the side. And now here's Jesus standing there inviting him to do that very thing. Verse 28, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Well, he's talking to you and I, folks. In other words, these things are written. You have a choice to be children of God. And to believe that Jesus is the son of the living God. And to be baptized in the water and the spirit. In order to be born. And to become a child of God. And then to partake of that communion meal. The loaf that represents his body and the fruit of the vine that represents his blood as recorded in Matthew 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And why would you believe? Well, because there's many other things written in this book that give us evidence. For example, the paths in the sea, written many, many, many generations ago or centuries ago about the paths in the sea. And when we then became seafarers, and began to travel the ocean blue. We began to find currents or paths in the sea that would help us to, to move from one continent to another. Or when he talks about the earth hanging as a spear in space, hanging on nothing. Well, for many, many years, people were flatlanders. What do you mean flatlanders? They thought the earth was flat. They didn't know it was round. And they thought if you'd sail out very far, you'd fall right off the earth. Well, now we fast forward and we learn that the earth is a sphere, and that it is round. And science today is still confounded with how the earth hangs out here in space on nothing. And yet, it was written many, many generations ago. And there's many other evidences that are written. And as we even continue on here in verse 30, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. That's what Christ means by definition. He is the anointed one. Well, who did they anoint back in these days? The king. He is the Christ, the son of God. And that believing you may have life 
in his name. Thank you for joining me through the journey of John. May God continue to bless you in your studies of John and some of the other passages that I have mentioned. God bless.